Hi, my name is Troy Holcomb and I'm a DNR forester who works with private landowners in Aiken County to help educate and motivate them to take action that will help them meet their goals as well as make the forests of Minnesota healthier and more productive. I'm excited to spend some time with you tonight talking about how a well-implemented timber harvest can help you do that. Our forests have evolved with disturbances for millions of years and still see them today, but they are less acceptable. If you think about it, society is not willing to allow wildfires to burn unchecked and we clean up damaged timber after windstorms. Logging can be both a tool to help respond to these disasters and also to help make our forests more resilient to these pressures. Professional foresters today use a well-managed logging to mimic disturbances in our forests. This also helps us to provide a multitude of other benefits of which I would like to discuss. The timber harvesting that occurs in Minnesota supplies raw materials for the state's fifth largest manufacturing sector. Currently, the forest products industry in Minnesota uses 2.7 million cords of wood each year. If that seems like a lot, consider that usage is down from 3.5 million cords in 2004. In fact, we are growing over 5.6 million cords of wood in our state each year and losing as much as 3 million cords to mortality from factors like insects, disease, and wind. The wood that gets harvested in Minnesota goes primarily to local manufacturers who create and sell their products on a global scale and in the process support 78,000 jobs and inject $18 billion into the state's economy. Let's look at the way that wood gets used in Minnesota. Nearly 60% of the wood harvested in Minnesota goes to paper mills in Grand Rapids, International Falls, or Cloquet. Interestingly, the Cloquet mill, Sappy, can switch to making a dissolved cellulose pulp that is used to make textiles as a replacement for oil-based synthetics and as an additive in pharmaceuticals and many, many other applications. The main species that go into making paper in Minnesota are aspen, spruce, and fir. <coughs> there are nearly 300 sawmills in Minnesota that use around 100,000 cords each year to create dimensional lumber like two by fours or wood shavings for animal bedding. A particularly large market is a manufacturer of pallets. Potlatch in Bemidji is the largest sawmill consumer. Savannah Pallets in McGregor is a large pallet manufacturer, but there are also many other small pallet manufacturers and sawmills around the state. Depending on what they make, sawmills use a wide variety of species. The pot potlatch mill by spruce, pine, and fir. Louisiana Pacific operates a mill and two harbors that makes the very popular smart siding seen on homes today. Norboard in Bemidji creates oriented strand board or OSB for sheeting houses. The main species that goes into these products is aspen and birch. There's also quite a bit of firewood that is sold as a result of timber harvesting. Even with the size of our forest products industry in America, we are still net importers of lumber, which comes primarily from Canada which is disappointing because we could be sustainably harvesting a couple million more cords per year just in Minnesota alone and would be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from shipping the lumber, as well as creating or keeping jobs in our own community. Despite how important our forest products industry is, there are many other reasons that we harvest timber. Creating wildlife habitat is another byproduct. By coordinating with wildlife biologists, we can create, maintain, or enhance wildlife habitat in the right places at the right times. A good example of this is rough grouse management areas where we can coordinate when harvesting occurs to provide the optimal arrangement of age classes of aspen in certain areas. For many people, hunting and wildlife viewing is the primary reason that they own their land. While there are many projects that can be done to create or increase habitat such as tree planting or invasive species control, a well-planned timber harvest can be the single biggest improvement that can be made. In some forest types, lack of management and long-term fire suppression can lead to a buildup of fuels that can make fires worse when they occur. The pictures here are from the recent Greenwood fire near Isabella in the Superior National Forest. The fire was started by lightning and occurred in an area that has been experiencing 
10 years or more of balsam fir mortality due to the spruce budworm. With lack of fire or logging, balsam fir grows thick under the canopy of mature forests and allows the fire to climb from the ground into the canopy of the forest. With more active logging in this area, there may have been less fuel and the fire would have been easier to suppress. Along with that, loggers need to be able to sell the wood they harvest for a profit. It is interesting how the strength of our mills can interact with the potential for severe and frequent forest fires. Using a timber harvest to keep our woods healthy and growing productively is a very common practice. A great example of this is thinning a pine plantation. We establish these plantations denser than the end goal to plan for some mortality and also to control the growth form of the trees. Plantations need periodic weeding, much like the carrots in your garden. We accomplish this with logging equipment by removing the smaller, poorly formed trees. This allows the remaining trees to grow better and healthier due to access to more water, sunlight, and nutrients. The same practice is applied in areas of mixed hardwoods. Forests that are too dense tend to have stressed trees due to competition for resources. This causes them to be predisposed to peaks in insect or disease populations, which can lead to tree mortality. Sometimes bad things happen in our woods. Big storms can blow down all the trees, or your pine trees may get bark beetles. Salvaging the damaged trees will help to ensure the future health and success of the forest. Lucky for us, we have a strong forest products industry with a good network of loggers and mills that buy wood. Maybe somewhat less known is that forests play a critical role in water quality. Consider that Minnesota is the headwaters of the Mississippi River and that a large part of the metro area relies on it for drinking water. Forest and watersheds can capture and hold large amounts of rainfall and meter them out slowly, reducing flooding. They do a great job of keeping excess nutrients out of waterways by holding soil in place and preventing runoff. Forest cover can help keep water temperatures lower, increasing the amount of oxygen in the water. According to the American Forest Foundation, 25% of U.S. freshwater is filtered through a privately owned forest. So how do timber harvests tie into this? Practices like regenerating our aspen or thinning our woods to keep them healthy will lead to long-term forested watersheds. Lack of management can cause a forest to convert to brushlands, which do not provide the same water quality benefits. I'm not advocating that people harvest all their trees near water, but I am suggesting that doing the right thing in the right place at the right time can lead to healthier forested watersheds. Research has shown that actively growing forests are an important solution to excess greenhouse gases. Forests are part of the solution because trees remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Because trees live a long time, they store the carbon long term, much longer than grasslands or farm fields. Additionally, research has shown that younger, more actively growing forests take up more carbon dioxide than older, slower, slower growing forests. Finally, when you consider the products that are made from our trees, such as two by fours, your house is actually storing carbon as well, and many times even longer than the life of some tree species. <clears throat> as we talked a little bit about, your trees have value. For most, making money is not the primary reason for conducting a timber harvest. Most are focused on the reasons we've already discussed, but I have yet to see a timber sale where the landowner did not make money. And while revenue may not be the driving motivator, it often determines whether or not the work actually gets done. In the end, a logger needs to be able to make money harvesting timber to be able to help you manage your forest. We've talked about the timber industry as a whole, but I want to add a few more ideas that might lend some perspective to our conversation. Logging is not the same as it was 100 years ago. I'm sure most of us have heard the stories about how all the pine was cut across Minnesota. Things have changed quite a bit since the late 1800s. These days, we develop long-term management plans based off of forest inventory data and stakeholder input. Most land management agencies meet third-party certification through the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Forest Stewardship Council. Loggers are different these days as well. They are well-educated and well-trained business professionals. They attend continuing education courses 
and are a part of their local communities. So where is all this forest management occurring? There are 15.7 million acres of forest land in Minnesota and about 9 million acres are public, managed for timber, wildlife, recreation, and water quality by county land departments, DNR, and the U.S. Forest Service. But that still leaves almost 8 million acres of privately owned forest, which is actually the single largest group of forest ownership in Minnesota. So what does that mean? It means that active and informed management of your land not only can benefit you, but frankly, the rest of society. When we talk about the forest products we all use or the wildlife and clean water that our forests produce, a well-managed forest benefits everyone. Interestingly, there were only 13.7 million acres of forest in Minnesota in 1986. Change in land use has led to a 2 million acre increase in forest land in the last 35 years. So we've talked a lot about why timber harvesting is an important tool for our economy and our landscape. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about some of the specifics that you need to know in order to use a timber harvest on your land because leaving your woods alone and doing nothing does not keep the woods the same. The woods still change. So how do you know where you could be harvesting timber from your woods? Let's go through a few common types of timber harvests. Aspen is the most common forest type in Minnesota. It is also the easiest to manage and is in the highest demand by the state's mills. When managed correctly, it can provide great wildlife habitat. <clears throat> Here's a picture of an aspen harvest in progress. It's conducted on frozen ground to provide good protection for soil and the tree roots that will allow for maximum regeneration after the harvest. Scattered standing trees provide habitat for fur bears and larger open areas allow maximum sunlight to reach the ground, increasing the amount of regeneration. Here's another picture during or just after a harvest. You can see that there's lots of coarse woody debris left on site for nutrient recycling. There's a good amount of scarification, which will increase natural seeding. And there's no rutting, which indicates that this was a good site with proper soil conditions for fall harvesting. Six months after a harvest, we see that the slash is beginning to break down and there's lots of herbaceous growth initially. Some standing dead trees left for habitat and some white spruce and paper birch reserves uh, for natural seeding and diversity on the site. <clears throat> One full growing season after harvest, um, there's a high density of aspen saplings vigorously regenerating as many as six to 10,000 stems per acre. There are some nicely scattered mature trees, which may eventually fall over and become drumming logs for rough grouse. There are nice, nice conifer reserves and patches of conifer on the edges for winter cover located next to a browse source for white-tailed deer. Eight years after a harvest, we still see a high density of aspen stems, which is great for rough grouse breeding and brood rearing. This is prime woodcock migration habitat because it provides protection from avian predators like hawks and owls. There's a highly developed shrub layer with species like hazel and dogwood, which makes for great uh, deer browse. Scattered conifer component within the stand provides diversity and some winter cover as well. And here's a picture of a aspen harvest 10 years later, which shows many of those um, same habitat values. Pine plantations, and especially red pine, can commonly be found. They are planted mainly to grow timber but when managed correctly, can also provide wildlife habitat. They are planted at a high density to account for seedling mortality and to encourage the trees to grow tall. Over time, these plantations need to be thinned to maintain a good growth and health. They are typically first thinned at age 30 and then about every 10 to 15 years after that for a total of three to four thinnings over the life of the stand a good rule of thumb is to remove one third of the volume by selecting the smaller, poorer quality trees and allowing the larger, better quality trees to grow better. Here's a picture of a 60 year old pine plantation that is what we can, would consider overstocked. There are too many trees in a given area. Now here is that same plantation after thinning. 
There's more sunlight hitting the ground, so a more, more robust ground and shrub layer will develop, which is better wildlife cover and browse. Over time, the remaining pine trees will grow larger and fill out the site. Finally, here's a picture of a 30-year-old pine plantation that, that just had a row thinning completed. The prescription here was to remove every third row. This allows enough room for equipment and creates growing space from the remaining trees. There will now be enough space for subsequent thinnings. The next thinnings can be more selective. Pine thinnings make sense because they generate revenue, help keep the remaining trees healthy and productive, and can increase wildlife habitat value. <clears throat> Stands of mixed hardwoods are also quite common, and these can be managed a couple different ways. Dense stands, or woods that have high-value trees, can be thinned using a single tree selection method. By removing individual, poor-quality trees and allowing the remaining better-quality trees more resources. This is more of a stand maintenance practice. This treatment mimics single tree mortality in the forest canopy. Here's a picture of a red oak stand where we marked the trees to keep, with the goal of removing the smaller trees. Lower quality stands of hardwoods can be treated by harvesting 80 to 100 foot gaps spaced throughout the stand. This mimics small scale blowdown events and creates openings where sunlight can reach the forest floor and allow new trees to become established. Gap harvests work great for landowners because it still leaves you a lot of mature forest while at the same time increasing the age and species diversity of your woods and providing income. Here's a map of a gap harvest that was harvested on private land. The green circles are where harvesting occurred and all other areas of the woods were left alone. The gaps are sized to provide enough sunlight for red oak, paper birch, and basswood to get established, which have more wildlife habitat value than shade tolerant maple and ironwood. So there are a lot of options for timber harvesting depending on the types of woods you have, and we've seen a few. Another factor to consider is when to harvest your timber. The timing of the treatment can have a big impact on the outcome. Winter harvests are the most common in Minnesota because we have a lot of low-lying areas. Harvesting when the ground is frozen can provide many advantages. It is often easier to access areas when swamps are frozen. Additionally, Harvesting when the ground is frozen also reduces negative soil impacts like rotting and compaction. In hilly areas, you can also avoid, avoid soil erosion. But because so much of our harvesting needs to occur in winter, loggers generally have more winter wood than they need, so they are not willing to pay as much. Also, in some cases, foresters want the leaf and needle litter on the forest floor to get disturbed by equipment. Species like oak and pine need their seeds to land on bare soil in order to germinate. If the goal of the harvest is to regenerate species from seed, winter harvesting might not give the disturbance needed. <coughs> Summer harvests occur less often in Minnesota, but are a great tool in the right place at the right time. <coughs> like we talked about, you can get better leaf litter disturbance, which can increase the diversity of your regeneration. Because summer accessible wood is at a premium, you can generally expect to see a little better price for your timber and have your timber harvested sooner if it can be done in the summer. You just need to monitor the operation and make sure rutting and soil compaction aren't occurring. This is one reason that it can be very useful to have a forester on your team. The first and most important step to take if you are thinking about dipping your toes into a timber harvest is to find a forester that you like and work with them. I'll help you find a forester later, but for now, I want to talk to you about the value that a forester can have for you. To implement an effective timber sale, you need to have a thorough perspective of all your woods and the landscape around you. A forester can help you assess the health and age of your woods and plan out current and future timber harvests to maximize their return in meeting your goals. Once you and your forester determine the best place and time to harvest your timber, they will develop an appraisal. Appraisals are important because they are used as a basis for negotiations and for setting clear expectations. You need to know what you have for sale. Appraisals also list the cutting specifications that you and your forester will develop. 
The species and the arrangement of the trees you reserve are just as important as the trees you harvest. It will also dictate how the slash is treated, piled or scattered across the site, among other things. It is important to offer your timber harvest out for bids to a group of appropriate loggers. This is the only way that you can be sure you are getting a fair price for your timber. Your forester should be able to help you develop a list of loggers that work in your area and are appropriate for the type of work you want to do. You would mail your appraisal to the loggers and request a bid for a price per cord that the loggers are willing to pay for you for your wood. A contract is an important document that protects both the seller, you, and the buyer, the logger. It makes assurances to the landowner that the logger will be insured and repair any accidental damage. It also lets the logger know that the wood for sale is actually owned by the seller and helps eliminate unrealistic outcomes. And through this process, what is actually happening is that you and your forester are working together to develop realistic expectations. Foresters have lots of experience with timber harvests and they can help you understand how, how the whole process will work. This is a time for you to ask questions. I'd like to talk more about what you can expect, but I want to get on my soapbox and say again that working with a forester is the most important step you can take to having a successful timber harvest. This is something that you may only do once in your life. It's important to take the time to do it correctly. Working with the forester can help you determine what to do and where, which will help you seize this opportunity to maintain or increase habitat values. What else can you expect? Some people have some reservations about timber harvests. Let's take a look at a few sticking points. One of the big questions people have is, will my property get damaged? There's always a small chance, but taking the right steps can reduce that chance. Working with the forester, setting clear expectations with your logger, having a pre-sale meeting and contract supervision, and using the protection of a contract go a long way to helping you realize a positive outcome. What about all the mess? Natural messes create habitat. Nature is messy and messy is habitat. Uh, one of the biggest comments we get is about the slash that people see on a site after a timber harvest. When I look at slash, I see nutrient recycling, I see habitat for fur bears and rabbits, and I see drumming logs for rough grouse. This can be a big change to your property. It's not gonna look the same, but within one growing season, things will start to look a lot different. And it will be a neat opportunity to observe the different types of wildlife and how they use this new area. Will I get ripped off? Not likely. If you take the steps of having a contract in place using forester supervision, there's very little chance that you will get ripped off. One of the biggest advantages of having a forester is that they, they can help you track the truckloads of wood that leave your property. We have a ticketing system that ensures that you will receive a volume report back from the mill for each truckload of wood. Your forester will help you account for every cord of wood that leaves your property, and that's what you will get paid for. So what type of equipment is used to harvest trees? Feller bunchers are the first piece of equipment on site. They can be tracked or wheeled, and they generally have low ground pressure. The hot saw on the bottom of that head stays running and the operator can use the hydraulic arms on the head to accumulate a bunch of trees and lay them down in a good spot. Grapple skidders come next and pick up the bunches of trees laid down by the feller buncher and pull them to the landing for processing. Grapple skidders are also used to carry slash back out into the harvest area and scatter it around or pile the slash on the landing. Stroke delimmers are used to remove the limbs from the tree and cut the top off at the minimum diameter, which is typically four inches. Delimmers are usually the heaviest piece of equipment and they stay parked on the landing and the wood is brought to them by the grapple skinner. A slightly less common participant on the logging site is the debarker chipper. 
Some companies will remove the bark and chip the whole tree. This provides great utilization of your trees and higher revenue. It also reduces the amount of slash left in the harvest area. The only caveat is that there is usually a pile of bark shavings left over. Finally, the slasher loader is used to cut the trees down to length, usually a hundred inch, and load the logs onto a truck. The pieces of equipment that we've just viewed typically work together in a system and are what we call a conventional logging equipment setup. Conventional equipment is very productive, meaning it makes a pile of wood quick. It is great for clear cuts and even certain thinnings. They require more space to work and need, need a little bit larger landing, which can turn into a great food plot. Conventional equipment is more common. Because of how it drags the trees across the ground, you can get better ground disturbance for natural seeding, so they are good for regeneration harvests. Becoming more popular, however, is the cut to length system. There are several different shapes and forms of a cut to length processor, but what is pictured here is the most common. This is a wheeled processor that combines the functions of the feller buncher, delimmer, and slasher into one. As you can see, it has cut a tree down and is running the tree through its head, cutting the tree to length and removing the limbs at the same time. Because the limbs are removed in the woods, that is where they stay. The equipment runs on this slash mat, which reduces ground impacts and gets the limbs close to the ground where they can rot quicker. The forwarder is a wheeled machine with a hydraulic arm and bunks on the back that does the jobs of the grapple skitter without dragging full trees behind it on the ground. A cut to link system works great for thinnings. They are designed especially for pine thinnings, but work in clear cuts as well. They do not produce as much wood per day as a conventional system, but they are slightly lighter on the, mat, lighter on the land, meaning less PSI ground impact. With cut to length, the slash is used as a travel mat for the equipment, which reduces running and compaction risk. It allows the slash to be compacted so it decays faster. Cut to length equipment provides very little ground disturbance. <clears throat> so who can help you? There are several places you can find a forester. The lion's share of the private land work in Minnesota is accomplished with the help of consulting foresters. Check out the Minnesota Association of Consulting Foresters website. Their whole job is to work with private landowners and walk them through the process of managing their woods. There are several wood consumers in Minnesota who have foresters on staff that work with private landowners. Sappy is the largest paper mill in Minnesota, located in Cloquet. LP is Louisiana Pacific, which operates a siding plant in two harbors. UPM is the Blandon paper mill in Grand Rapids. PCA is the company that owns the Boise paper mill in International Falls. Potlatch Deltic operates a stud mill in Bemidji. All of these companies have foresters on staff that work with landowners to plant timber harvests and purchase standing timber. You can also work with a DNR forester. There is one who serves the area where your woods are, and we offer a wide variety of services. I often take an introductory walk with a landowner on their land to help them understand their woods better. We can help design timber sales and walk you through the process. We can also help you design projects such as invasive species control or tree planting and access cost share funds to pay for them. However, a consulting or industry forester is going to be able to help you more closely, your more closely administer your timber sale once it begins. DNR foresters often have competing workloads such as fire suppression or state timber harvests during certain times in the year. I apologize that the graphic is so small, but if you want to find a DNR forester to help you, check out our website, the DNR website, or just Google MN. DNR, Forest Stewardship. The Minnesota Forestry Association is a great organization made up of fellow landowners who have a strong stewardship ethic. They have a really neat call before you cut service in which they will send you a packet of free, no obligation advice for you to read through at your own pace if you are wondering about timber harvesting. I encourage people to check out minnesotaforestry.org 
and consider joining. There are a lot of other landowners out there that have been through what you are going through. A final option for resources is to work directly with a logger. The Minnesota Logger Education Program is the organization that provides continuing education and certification for the state's quality group of loggers. I like MLEP.org because they have a searchable directory. I use this a lot to find loggers that work in my area. This is useful when developing a list of loggers to send your timber appraisal out for bids. Thank you so much for the time and for the opportunity to talk about how timber harvesting trees from your woods can be an effective tool to helping you reach your land management goals. I hope you've seen how important timber harvesting is on our economy and how it can make a positive impact on the health and habitat of our woods. It was my goal for you to understand a little bit more about the value of working with the forester and what the timber harvest process looks like and where you can find resources and support. With that, I've left my contact information here and I look forward to phone calls. Thanks again.